Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, part two, a follow-up to our Karen Avery Forum that focused on uh, parents and families involved in or at risk of involvement in the uh, child welfare system. The Karen Avery Forum, November 15th, was titled Listening to the Voice of Parents at the Intersection of Race, Gender, Mental Health, and Child Welfare, and explored uh, issues of parent peer support and parent lived experience in with child welfare from Rides Magazine and with uh, J Judge Trigiano and two very successful uh, participants in the client family-centered drug treatment court at Children's Court. And so that was the basis of our, uh, that led to all the other things we could talk about. So we decided to have two more. The second kind of moving to the next level from first being people with lived experience the second being people that uh, work on policy and services with an emphasis on that same uh, approach of listening to and centering things around the direct, the needs of the parents and families to try to minimize uh, on, on due separation or disruption of family unit. So that's where, where we are today is to look at um, agencies that work with uh, support direct uh, with direct support and listening to parents. So we have four uh, presenters, and I'll do just the, the quick titles here, uh, and then do a little more for uh, detailed uh, with each individual speaker. The first speaker is Brigetta Wilson, who's got the wonderful title of lived experience strategic advisor with the Wisconsin Department of uh, Children's and Families. And she's working to uh, help DCF coordinate and incorporate parents' lived experience into all the policies and practices and programs at DCF, which is uh, very important. Christine Alstrup, who's one of our, our steering committee members, is the Vice President of Clinical Services at Meta House, which has a long history of being a leader in working with parents and families and where where they are, I guess, is one way to, to think of it, but to avoid separation and working with uh, with families intact and avoiding separation in child welfare or other uh, riskier situations. Uh, Keisha Shanks is the policy director of the Black Child Development Center Institute. I can't get that correct. You can correct me, uh, Keisha. And she's also a board member of the Benedict uh, Center. And then last, uh, fourth is Lauren Folds, who is heading up a program. She's a program manager at Community Advocates Strong Families Program, which is a relatively new program that tries to provide direct services for what parents need. So rather than things going, you know, hopefully you know, along a, a route with a you know, somewhat prosecutorial system in child welfare uh, to try to interrupt that by looking at housing and mental health and other needs that the family actually needs to uh, to, to be healthy and successful. So uh, the, the first will, will be Brigetta, and I'll read uh, read part of her, her introduction here. Brigetta Wilson is a positive person and advocate, community leader, and change agent. She's been working for and with families for over 20 years in Wisconsin. Brigetta uh, Advocacy Work that includes uh, working with Puch Charitable Trust and the National Organization uh, Foster Club on Capitol Hill to bring awareness and issues regarding children and family on behalf of Wisconsin. She's a recipient of the Black Excellence Award for her work around child and youth advocacy. And Brigetta's current role as lived experience strategic advisor with the Department of Children and Family includes working with lived experience partners to elevate their voices and share their experiences to help make change that to systems that include programming policy and legislation. I'll stop there to not cut into Brigetta's time and let her share her, uh, her, her story and her work with us. Unmute, Brigetta. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, my computer is a little delayed, and let's hope that me sharing is not going to cause any disruption. So I'm sending, so let's send some good positive energy to the technology gods for all of us today. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. I am grateful to be here with you all um, to share a little bit about the work that I do here um, at Department of Children and Families. Um, so 
I may have to ask Barbara to share my presentation because my computer is kind of freezing up. I'm not sure if you're able to pull it up and I just don't um, want to risk sure, that. Just, thank you, Brigitte. Just give me a minute. Jeannie okay. is available to help us. I just need to send it to her. Okay. I'm getting froze and then my screen's black. I can still hear you all, but I seen is kind of acting crazy, but I am here. And um, I guess I'll just really um, get started to share a little bit about, I've been in this role for a year and a half. And what's really interesting about the lived experience space at DCF. When I first started here, this was a project position. Um, and this position was looked um, was um, slated to end in 2025. But one of the things that um, we want to be intentional about as we begin to be more mindful of how to um, embed the voice of lived experience and families into the fabric of system change is really being intentional on how do we create more permanency in this role. And so effective just this past November, this position became a permanent position, which is a real, um, I would say challenging sometimes thing to do in government to create permanent positions, but understanding the investment and the value of family's voice is something that our administrator um, was very passionate about making happen. So um, this position is, well, it's a permanent position now, which creates another level of um, contributions to how we can impact the system. So um, I'll just go over my pre start my presentation to really say, you know, lived experience voice is um, a journey. It really helps support our advocacy, education, and training to a wide array of internal and external stakeholders. Um, the voice of those with lived experience helps provide a different lens into the child welfare and youth justice system, and their input is included and infused to help improve programs, policies, support workforce, as well as contribute to legislation that serve children, youth, and family. Um, and lived experience voice is essential to put in families first, which is a new initiative. I want uh, I won't say a new initiative, but one of our strategies when you think about how do we make sure that more children are staying in home with their families and that families are getting the support that they need to thrive and be able to be successful in the community in the state of Wisconsin. So when you think about why do we engage those with lived experience, um, those Brigitte, with lived ex Excuse okay. me, Brigida, are you seeing the, the PowerPoint? Yeah. Now yeah. I brought it up. Okay. okay. The third slide, please. Okay. My screen is still dark, but if you guys see it, I have it on my other screen. Um, so um, why do we engage those with lived experience? Okay, there we go. Uh, and then you can share this too with the group afterwards, and they can also have my contact information. But, um, but understanding that he's, um, lived experience is essential to transforming child welfare. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, submitted a, um, provided a memo uh, for children and families um, to really highlight the importance. So in August of 2019, this memo was released. And some of the highlights in that memo was really um, understanding that authentically preparing, partnering with individuals who can provide lived experience is essential in um, transforming our child welfare system. Leaders in child welfare have been called upon um, by child welfare agencies to really empower, engage, as well as utilize family voice in all aspects of child welfare to help drive ca case planning and system improvement. It's critical. Um, to listen and integrate family voice to strengthen efforts, um, understanding that engaging lived experience must occur at multiple levels and acting on the information provided can really reshape the child welfare system to truly strengthen families in our community. Um, engaging families, on the next slide. Sure. What, okay, no, keep going. Slide number four. I feel like I, okay. Is this the one you want with the youth leadership team? The next, the one right after that. Okay. Um, this is the last one, I think. Um, doesn't seem to, oh, I don't know. I know technology, Mercury's in retrograde. That's what I it think is. it's the one previous, Here. not after. 
so relative caregiver stakeholder group no it, okay i'm for me i don't it's okay it's stuck my screen is frozen um but it says why engage those with lived experience engaging empower okay. Okay. We have that up now. Okay. Engaging, empower, and utilize family voice um, in all aspects, aspects of child welfare. It's just, um, I can't hit home on that enough. Understanding that families, we interact with families on all different levels. And at all of those levels, it's important that we are, that we are collectively engaged in families' voice. Um, the Capacity Building Center for States really highlights diversifying the child welfare with um, with um, lived experience expertise. So really um, it's critical to listen and integrate family and youth voice to strengthen our efforts. It'll help support the next better outcomes at an individual program initiative and agency levels. And it helps reduce disparities in child welfare systems. Um, Wisconsin is known to have one of the highest disparities when you think about the number of youth who are um, in Native American or tribal families and or African American families, um, they are disproportionate, um, disproportionately, um, they make up our child welfare system. So how do we use lived experience voice to help address some of those things? So one of the things that we have at, um, at DCF is our youth, our different stakeholder groups. And so if you could go to the next slide, the Youth Advisory Council slide, it really highlights um, investing in youth, investing in those with lived experience. And so this council that we have really makes up youth ages 16 to 26, and all of them have experience in child welfare. Uh, we have seven regional youth advisory councils and one statewide youth advisory councils. Our regional youth advisory councils meet monthly, and our statewide youth advisory council meets five times per year. And one of the reasons why I bring this up is because everyone who may in come in contact with the youth who um, may be searching for a space to, to vent about their experiences, this is a space where they can do that. Um, uh, the Youth Advisory Council has been essential to certain things that have been accomplishments, such as mandated foster parent training. So their voice have been instrumental to helping these things happen for Wisconsin. Um, health insurance for youth aging out of foster care through Badger Care, because youth are aging out without health insurance. And that was, we know, a challenge because we need health insurance. And so that's been in place for almost over a decade, <laughs> but youth voice was instrumental in doing so. Um, the Foster Youth Handbook, as well as many and other local state efforts. The next slide, please. Um, the youth leadership team really focuses on youth who have experience with youth, the youth justice system. We currently have one youth leadership team that works across the state, um, and that they meet four times per year. And this group has been instrumental when you think about helping workers, judges, law enforcement have a better sense of what ways they can work with youth. And there are some resources that I'll share with you all about um, that highlight youth voice as well as um, you can use in your work settings or share with others. The next slide. Um, our relative caregiver stakeholder group. Now, what's interesting about our relative caregiver stakeholder group is it is caregivers of minor children, of those who are involved in child welfare and those who are informally involved and where that's where it's family arranged, where it's voluntary kinship or voluntary guardianship. And this group meets quarterly or as needed. They have been instrumental in helping create the DCF Kinship Navigator resource um, tool so that parents can have access to um, resources that are dedicated to um, families who are caregivers and not necessarily, um, but kinship caregivers. And so it's a resource that um, kinship care providers can use and access. They help support the Families Like Mine annual conference. Um, and that count conference happens annually. Um, and they are instrumental in planning as well as help, helping to support some of those efforts. Okay, now I see it moving, but it's usually the next one as well as some caregiver stakeholder group is where I'm talking to Barbara. Next slide. Um, they've developed a Kinfax resource guide. And this resource guide is um, something that individuals can use statewide. 
and they are very instrumental as well when it comes to family voice. And one of the things is lived experience looks different because all of these stakeholder groups, they have different experiences in child welfare, youth justice. And so their input is, um, is valuable no matter where they show up. And then last but not least, our parent leader stakeholder group. Um, I'm not sure if you're, so it's the eighth slide. And this group is unique because this is our first um, stab, so to speak, or our first endeavor walking down the path with parents. And so when we think about parents who experience child welfare, um, really being able to be mindful of those experiences of their experiences and be willing to listen because this group makes up families that are mothers and fathers across Wisconsin. Their case is diverse from adoption, TPR, out of home care or youth justice. And this group meets monthly. They have been instrumental in really um, supporting my role as a lived experience strategic advisor here, um, supporting ongoing DCF initiatives, such as our safety revisions as and, and our initial assessment process. And that's a huge thing when you think about how do we look at how we define safety and how do we look at the initial assessment process and how that works. And so really looking at ways that lived experience voice can contribute to those changes that is coming. Um, as well as being mindful of legislation and how important that is when you think about child welfare. And so we, um, we currently created a, a, a space for lived experience voice to be included on our internal bill analysis form that we submit when it comes to various legislation efforts that are taking place across the state. Uh, Brigetta, this is Pete. Um, Am I, am I over time? Uh, just about. So, okay, I'll, um, so I'll stop. Started a little late, but it, okay. can you? I'll wrap up. Uh -huh. See if we can do a streamlined end, and then we can loop back later. Hopefully, some question time at the end. But okay, no, sorry, I just I I feel like the my the technology is not our friend today. Um, I guess I'll wrap it up just by being intentional about talking about our Parent Support and Parents Program, which is a new effort that has really been um, lived experience in action, having parent partners um, connect with those who um, are currently in the child welfare system and helping parents navigate the system. And so parent um, supporting parents is an evidence-based model, and it really helps empower those with um, child welfare experience as mentors to those currently in the system. So as we continue to think about building on lived experience, parent supporting parents is one of those models that we have currently within three different counties, as well as um, some innovation um, partners here within Milwaukee. And we're looking to expand that. So we're gonna have applications opening in late spring for in agencies that are interested in supporting parent partners um, within their agency dealing with um, of those dealing with child welfare. Yeah, um, that, that sounds so. wonderful, Brigetta. The, Thank uh, you. Uh, we, we've talked in the past about the Seattle program, the Parents for Parents, so that sounds great. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can talk more about helping helping that come about because that peer support model is critical and dovetails with a lot of the successful stuff in the mental health area. Uh, is this okay to break here and, and go on and then hopefully we'll have a little time? Yeah, no, end? that's fine. My, I hey. keep getting frozen, so... You can, yeah, no, yeah I don't know what's that. happening. <laughs> it's okay. I don't know what's going on. I may have to join, log out and log back in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think Barbara can readmit you if we do that. So I'm trying to start my own video here. Um, maybe I won't be able to start my own. Um, okay, I think I'm back on. Uh, okay, so sorry um, for my not keeping this... Uh, on schedule as much, but that was uh, excellent. Hope we can fill in a little bit more. Um, so next, uh, Christine Alstrup. Uh, Christine is Vice President of Clinical Services at Meta House, where she has been employed for 27 years. In her current position, she oversees all of Meta House's, oops, I think I'm frozen again. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, Pete. I'll turn my video off and that will stop me from freezing, I think. Can you hear me still? Yes, we can okay. hear you, Pete. All right, sorry. Uh, in her current position, she oversees uh, all of Meta, Meta House's clinical programs, residential, outpatient, and recovery housing. She was responsible for the vision, goals, and coordination of services across her continuum of care. 
She develops policies and procedures, implements grants and oversees certification and licensing. She also develops and maintains relationships with community resources. Uh, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll stop there not to cut into Christine's time because she can better tell you about herself than I can. Uh, thank you, Pete. Um, the only thing I would add to that that I should have in my bio, because it's important to say, is that I'm a person with lived experience and benefited from Meta House Services 28 years ago. Thank so um, I know that many of you probably um, in this meeting um, are aware of Meta House and, and know what we do, um, but there are probably some who don't. So I'm going to you know run through um, made a house and our philosophy and and um, our how we serve families. And then I specifically wanted to just highlight a current grant that we have. So I'll I'll talk about that as well. So Made a House has been around um, since 1963, and we've always done gender-specific treatment, and we have always served women. We started out with this little house and uh, Wauwatosa in 1963, and the person who owned the house, her name was Maida Orth, and so that's how we became Maida's house. So who do we serve? I don't have our 2022 um, data yet. We're working on that, but um, this is who we served in, in 2021, and when I look at this data, obviously the pandemic uh, plays a part in it. Um, because we tend to serve much, uh, many more women, more towards 500, um, more pregnant women, um, and, and more children. But because of the pandemic, we had to uh, cut down on many of our services. But nonetheless, um, we serve 350 women and 212 children. And you can read that other data, um, you know, 24% did not graduate from high school, um, 95% earn less than 20%, and the bottom one, 39% were involved with child welfare. So talking a little bit about our treatment approach at Meta House, as I said, we do gender-specific treatment. So our client of focus is someone who identifies as being a woman. Um, 75% of our clients report some sort of history of abuse or trauma. 74% um, of the women we serve are mothers. And we know that it's critical for, our, for the women for their long-term success is that we understand that they don't live in isolation, that there are children involved, there are other family members involved. And for them to be successful, we have to provide services to everyone in the family. We recognize that addiction is a disease and we use evidence-based practices to um, treat our women and children and families. So our treatment setting, um, we've got our residential treatment program where we have 35 beds for women. We have 15 beds for children uh, 12 years and under. So Meta House was one of the first treatment facilities in the nation who started including children coming into residential care with their mothers because women would get to us and they would start talking about their children and they'd be concerned about their children and they weren't necessarily focusing on their treatment. So as much as possible, if it's appropriate, we try to include children into the, our residential program. Now, because of the pandemic, those numbers, we weren't at 35 these last two years, we've had to um, serve less women, um, hoping to build that up this year. Um, we So besides our residential, we also have an outpatient treatment uh, program where we do all levels of care um, currently, Monday through Friday, that probably will expand in the near future, where we'll have some um, more later in the evening programming and some weekend programming. But the same services that are available basically in our residential treatment program are available in our outpatient treatment program, but they go home or go stay somewhere. 
The other program we have is our recovery housing community. And I'm gonna talk more about that because that's where the grant I wanna um, highlight to you is focused on. Um, it's a combination of our outpatient treatment and our recovery housing community. So we have um, a total of 25 apartments in the community. They're located between first and second on Locus. 15 of those apartments are um, for families and 10 of them are units that women share. Um, our location, we're in the River West area. Um, the building on the top is one of our residential who's that, that building sits right next to the next building right below that. Those are just some shots of the um, interior of the building. So um, across that whole continuum of care I talked about, we do one-on-one um, -on -one services, we do group services. Um, I'll talk more about that child and family team. Um, we're um, very um, robust in our peer support um, incorporating into all levels of care. We have voc ed on site, uh, case management, connection to medication assisted treatment and experiential therapies. Um, so we do specialize in making sure that pregnant women get what they need. Um, we have a advanced nurse practitioner on site um, and our full uh, child and family team is very versed in uh, treating pregnant women. Um, they can also do uh, mental, uh, or, um, infant mental health services. We assess moms for postpartum um, and work with them and the community uh, health partners who were whichever hospital system they decide to deliver their baby. This is just a snapshot of the residential program schedule. The reason we I put that in a slide presentation is just to show you how comprehensive and how intense residential services are. So it's Monday through Friday where they are intensely receiving services from eight o'clock in the morning until um, early evening. So our recovery housing. So our families um, can stay up to a year in our housing community. Um, it's a safe, supportive structure. We have on-site staff. So we have someone with lived experience. One of our peer supports actually has one of the apartments. We uh, provide intensive case management. We do community activities is really about getting these families and the women out into the community so they can start developing support in the community. Um, that could be 12 step groups, that could be other support systems. It's also just learning how to have fun together and to find activities in this fine city because we've got a lot of them that are free and don't always include um, drugs and alcohol, although sometimes, but then how do they navigate that? And, and we show them how to do that and to support that. Um, the requirements to get in, because it's a recovery community, we do ask that they've got at least 45 days of substance free before they're eligible for the program. Um, and that was a little trickier over the pandemic and we weren't always full, but we tend to be full now or getting more full in all of our units. We also um, require that they, oops, I just hit something there, didn't I? That they attend um, outpatient services and they are engaged in something, sorry, I'll get to that slide. They're engaged in, um, they have to be engaged in something 20 hours of their week. So we know that people, especially in early recovery, it's important for them to have structure and have a purpose in what they're getting, um, what they're doing each day. So they might come to our outpatient clinic for a while, but then eventually maybe they're back at school or they're working or they're in an apprentice program and they're working on being um, self-sufficient. So the grant I wanna to talk you, to you about, I have a few more minutes here, is a what's called a regional partnership grant. And it's a combination um, with the uh, Children's Bureau, the administration of, of child and families at the federal level, and the 
Administration of Child and Families at the federal level puts out these grants that they call RPG grants. I did it again. There we go. Um, so it's administered by um, the Children um, and Administration of Children and Families. And the goal is to improve the well being of children affected by substance use um, disorders. These grants um, have to be collaborative. So we need to partner with um, other agencies. And I can see I have to move this along a little bit. Um, these started in 2007 at the federal level. Um, since then, um, they've given 109 projects across 39 states. This is round seven. We also were involved in round four. Um, so for this uh, grant, our focus is our families um, in need of substance use disorder treatment and recovery housing who are either involved with child welfare or at risk of being involved with child welfare. You can see our partners on that. So we're working, one of our partners is um, DMCPS um, at the state level, the Division of Care and Treatment, um, FDTC, uh, and IMPACT does our evaluation for the grant. So the parts of the grant is our, what we wanna demonstrate is that when you combine recovery housing and outpatient services, um, that um, family reunification is stronger, the families are stronger, that um, calls to um, 220 safe go down, children are not removed and they stay with the family. We use these um, evidence-based practices um, as part of the grant. And here are the intensive services that um, the parents are getting in our housing program and in our outpatient services. So they all have in-home parenting. They all have an in-home parenting coach. And we, um, the other important part of this grant is that we're expanding our peer supports so that the peers are have we have more peers who can work these with these families and then increase the um, community involvement so that we can, as I said earlier, get them into the community and develop that recovery capital, which helps with success in recovery. I'm not going to go through all these goals. You guys have a link um, to the um, PowerPoint. Um, I will tell you this though, and this is the um, design and this is a lot to go into too, but for this grant, we're doing um, a quasi experimental design. So there are people who are getting both the recovery housing and our outpatient services who will be compared to a group of women who are just getting our outpatient services and not the recovery services. Um, this is similar to our last round when we had this grant and we had some really um, good results demonstrating that when you combine outpatient services, intense in-home services for these families um, and that structure of the housing and strong peer support that um, family reunification and retention increases by, um, let's see, in our last grant, 94% of the women avoided um, any more contact with child welfare or calls to child welfare. So I think I hit my time. That would be a good stopping point, Christine. Thank you, that was excellent. And Barbara posted in the chat uh, that both uh, Christine's presentation and Brigetta's are available. I'm not sure myself how to capture things from a chat, but uh, that, that should be preserved for people to grab those in printed or in PowerPoint form to be able to, uh, to use that. So uh, we'll move next to Keisha. Uh, Keisha Shanks is a creative, passionate, and outspoken advocate who has spent the last 13 years dedicated to the psychosocial advancement of women, children, and families. As a mother, infant mental health consultant, and small business owner, she understands the many intersex and complexities of motherhood and its impact on both maternal and child health outcomes. Keisha is the president and CEO of Yemoja Wellness Group, LLC, 
a boutique coaching and consulting firm, and she serves as policy director for BCDI Milwaukee, which is Black, Black Child Development Institute, Milwaukee. And Keisha is also on the board of the wonderful organization, the Benedict Center. So we'll turn it over to Keisha. One, thank you. Um, so I am just going to speak freely because I, I do not have a presentation or, or slides to share. Um, really what I wanted to talk more, use my time to talk more about is the need for intersectionality within our, our work with children and families, um, especially those families that are involved in the child welfare system. Um, I've spent the last 13 years um, running a home visiting program specifically for um, mothers that are expecting um, or that have re recently given birth. And in my program, I work with the entire family. So the, the mom and, and the, ba the baby and the pregnancy are the entry point and are the focal point. However, um, it's important to establish those strong relationships with the entire family to ensure um, best possible outcomes uh, for baby. Can you all hear and see me okay? Because I'm I'm not. Yes, yes. it's coming yeah. through yes. great, Keisha. Thank you. Okay. Yes. okay, thank you. It's it's not showing on my screen, so I was a little confused for a second. Um, okay. Um, so so one of the things with with my program is that it's very intentional and it's very relationship focused. Being an infant mental health professional. Um, the relationship between mom, baby, and any other caregivers are, are critical to a child's development. And we see that disruption happen um, between those relationships when child welfare gets involved. So one of the things that, um, that I've always focused on in my program is to try to eliminate that and to avoid that separation. Um, so working with parents on not just those day-to-day um, -day life skills and living skills and, and, and parenting skills, but even um, navigating systems, resources, um, communicating with their caregivers, understanding their child's development, what is developmentally appropriate, what is not, um, understanding how their babies communicate, and um, being able to really assist them in developing those strong relationships with their children so that their children are um, emotionally and mentally well. Um, so, so with that, and, and when other systems get involved, sometimes there's, there's a break there, there's a disconnect. And we're seeing so many children, specifically black children, majority, I, I'm not sure of the exact percentage, but I believe it's upwards of 60% of children in the child welfare system are, um, are black. And, and that's concerning. Um, being policy director with Black Child Development, one of the things that um, that we focus on is how we can improve advocacy around matters such as this so that children are not being removed from the homes unnecessarily. So identifying ways that children uh, and families can be worked with and ways to support families in a way that is um, beneficial and healthy for the entire family unit. Um, obviously, if there's instances where there's a safety concern, then that's different, but a lot of times children are removed for, for issues that could have been remedied with stable housing. Um, and so how can we work cross system to ensure that families are not only staying intact, but that they are being supported in the best way possible? Um, I'm trying to think what else did I have to say? Does anyone have any questions or anything? Am I so far? I don't see anything in the chat, Keisha. Um, yeah, this. Um, do Do you want to uh, hand it over to Lauren, or do you want to? Should we wait a minute to see if anybody has any questions? Um, one of the things that I will say is um, when we are working with with families, and I want to make sure that you know with all of the programs and the evidence based programming and things like that, that we are um, keeping in mind the humanity and um, the dignity of the families that we are serving. 
Um, sometimes when we get caught up in the bureaucratics of, of the systems or whatever our specific roles are, whether it's you know, mental health support, whether it's social work or whatnot, we get caught up in that and we forget that we are having an impact on real people and these outcomes have lifelong trajectories. Um, being, being relational and being intentional in our engagements, those things are very, very important in this work. Um, I really cannot stress that enough. And, um, and, and being mindful of, of, other, of other options. So really kind of imagining what all of this work looks like. And when I speak about working across systems, you know, if, if it's the child welfare system, working with mental health professionals to um, really provide wraparound care and support for families that are involved in the child welfare system or, um, families that are not involved, if you're coming through your program, making sure that we are providing that wraparound and personalized support and, um, and really holistic support and um, to ensure the best, and that's really just ensures the best outcomes for, for the families that we are interacting with and specifically um, the children. I think there was a question. I, um, I, I just see Keisha, you are the best. Thank you for your great work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in terms of policy recommendations, um, there are a number of things that uh, we are currently that are currently on the, the table for um, for policy recommendations as it relates to children and families. One of those things is obviously expanding Medicaid so that um, postpartum coverage is expanded to 12 months. Those things have um, lifelong impact on, on the health, overall health and well-being of families. Um, when we're looking at mental health as expanding infant mental health consultation, early childhood mental health consultation. Right now, infant mental health and early childhood mental health is one of those things that um, it's not new, but it's kind of new to to the masses because it's not something that's been talked about. Even though it's been studied extensively, we don't tend to look at children as, as people. We tend to look at them as possessions. So we don't understand when we're talking about infant mental health and early childhood mental health, you know, we don't realize that babies have feelings and the things that they experience, the the mood and the, the temperament of their caregivers, it has an impact on their brain development. It has an impact on their personality, how they show up for themselves, how they perceive themselves. And those things start um, early on. Those things start in the womb and they carry on and they develop based on their experiences with their caregivers. And so when we're talking about infant mental health, it's it's important that we begin to uh, infuse that into our systems and into our care networks um, and our care systems that we're providing for families because when families don't know the the impact of those early childhood experiences and how they have how they impact the middle school and high school and even in adult life you know you have a lot of adults that are um and you know adults that are struggling with things that have happened to them when they were four and five years old, three years old, things that they may not necessarily remember, but their body remembers and their body um, neurologically responds. And so they do things and they have these visceral reactions to things, not really understanding why. So part of that expanding infant mental health consultation really is allowing and giving access to um, organizations and to families to get that mental health support early on and that way um, we can provide those early interventions to prevent you know further trauma or um, poor outcomes or adverse outcomes later on in life and um, policy wise that's one of the things um, we have an advocacy day coming up in on March 1st and um, believe February 24th. I'll have to get the exact dates and I can get that out to you all. But um, really giving, providing information to legislators and, and, and uh, trying to influence and inform 
and educate legislators, community members, um, stakeholders on the importance of infant mental health consultation, why it's effective, why it's necessary, how it has impact, not just in the mental health um, field, but when we're looking at social work and when we're looking at education, uh, when we're looking at even, even workforce, you know, people, people that are working, they have children and, you know, having a new child, you know, there's perinatal mental health. So that postpartum things that people need support and they need information and they need education around um, infant and early childhood development mentally and emotionally and that social emotional learning um, and infant mental health, increasing access or um, increasing funding for infant and early childhood mental health consultation can create larger access to those services. Yeah, thank you, Keisha. Also for re-emphasizing the need to look at the humanity and dignity of people involved in the system. I think people get locked in their checklist of what their job is and you don't realize what you're really doing and where there's this potential for trauma to the child from separation. I think that gets lost in people's focusing on what they think their job is. So hopefully we can connect more with that advocacy and other things about maybe some policy and other things that get some groups to work together on. So uh, thank you, Keisha. And let's, uh, we're, you know, our time um, goes really quickly here. So uh, we'll have uh, the last uh, speaker here is, is Lauren Falls from, uh, uh, community advocates. She's been with community advocates for three years. She and I met doing things relating to housing and eviction and COVID time, and now she's moved on to working with the uh, with community advocates on the Stronger Families program. And again, because of time, I'm going to not go into details about the program because that would be overlapping. I think what uh, what Lauren can talk about, but it's focusing on that step of actually connecting people with services and essential needs. So. Uh, Lauren, uh, take it away, please. Thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Just verify that you got, all can see this. Yes, we can see it, Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Sorry, on mute. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I am the program manager of the Stronger Families Milwaukee program. We just started this program up in March of 2022 um, at the Public Policy Institute at Community Advocates. So we just started taking referrals in April of 2022. So this is a fairly new program. So I just thought I'd give a little overview of the program. Um, the Stronger Families Milwaukee program provides voluntary services to families that are called into Child Protective Services of Milwaukee County. Um, and investigated by an initial assessment worker. Um, those initial assessment workers then either determine that they have a safety threat in the home or no safety threat. And so if there's no safety threat, they're then referred over to our program. Um, I then give the family a call and verify that they're interested in the program and if they have any questions. And then I will assign them to an engagement specialist. So the engagement specialist works directly with the family to provide case management services um, to pr pr promote parent and child stability. Uh, the goal of the program is to connect families to resources and provide case management so that they lower the chances of them returning to child protective services. So we work together with the Parenting Network and New Life, which are two partner agencies in this program that house our parent and youth um, peer specialists. Uh, in our first two quarters, the top five needs that I were identified by the initial assessment workers that referred the families over was housing, family therapy, counseling, parenting support, and kids activities. So the benefits of enrollment. So we um, we make a little one pager and we give these out to the families just so they have a full understanding of what they're getting into with the program um, before they agree to enroll. So um, these are just some of the benefits that we highlight um, connecting to other community advocates programs. So this is like housing, energy assistance and legal aid, and then also external resources that we can connect them to. Um, free parenting classes and other and after school and summer educational programs for children. So that would be through either our new life program or 
maybe another agency is closer to where they live, so that would be more convenient for them. Um, short and long-term goal planning. So at enrollment, we complete some forms with them and just kind of get a better, a better understanding of where they're at and help them set those goals. Um, we help- Lauren, Lauren, just a quick question came up in the chat. I thought maybe it was a good time. Uh, there was a question if, if uh, there's not a direct referral from uh, IA from initial assessment, I think, uh, can they, can someone uh, just on, on their own contact your program and get some of these services or is it referral only? As of right now, we only take referrals from um, DMCPS. Thank you. Yep. Um, so then we also, you know, work with them to improve relationships with their family and peers. So we just um, can refer them to parenting support, um, therapy, counseling, just anything that we think would be beneficial. Um, learning coping strategies and financial assistance, which will, I will go over some of the things we're able to help them with. Um, first of all, I just wanted to cover par participant expectations. So once they're enrolled, um, they do complete the assessment process, um, which is enrollment forms and then an Arizona self-sufficiency matrix, which I will go over in a um, future slide. Um, they participate in two weekly home visits with an engagement specialist to create and follow a case plan. Um, so we do have some flexibility around this. Um, we want to make sure we're helping as many families as we can. So if a family maybe um, works you know, a lot of hours and they just can't do those two weekly visits with a case manager, um, we will allow them to do one in-home visit and one virtual visit. So we just want to make sure we're servicing as many families as we can. Um, attend classes and individual coaching in partnership with Parenting Network, as well as the programming with New Life. Um, again, this is all voluntary, so they don't have to, but we do motivate them during their time in the program to participate in those activities. Um, providing updates to their peer support advisor and engagement specialists, and working towards creating a safe and healthy environment for their family. Um, so we highlight the importance of working with families. Um, we do this through our Arizona self-sufficiency matrix, um, which I will go over in detail a little bit more, but this just allows us to break down with the families um, different topics in their life, maybe help them understand a little bit better what they need to prioritize, and we let them set those goals for themselves. Um, we make a, we have a strength-based approach, um, just kind of doing some motivational interviewing, allowing them to take steps towards their goals, and then stepping in when they say, hey, I need a little bit more help with this, because maybe they're not familiar with the process. And then just emphasizing team effort. So we collaborate with the initial assessment person that referred them to make sure we have an understanding of the history of this family so that we know how to best serve them. Um, and then peer supports, which are at New Life and Parenting Network, and then the engagement specialist. So we just make sure everyone is communicating with each other and allowing the family to speak for themselves. Um, so just a little separate, making sure it's clear, the engagement specialists do those two weekly visits. Um, they're the ones that are making those referrals to internal and external programming. Um, and then mental health, for example, we assist them in locating nearby services, um, as well as making sure we provide everyone with a 24-hour crisis line that they can call because we don't work um, the full 24 hours. So we want to make sure that they have someone they can reach out to um, when we're not available. And then securing transportation to those counseling services or family therapy. Um, creating and implementing goals into case plan, and then monitoring um, their goals and the, the self-sufficiency matrix, and then collaborating with the, the peer support advocates. Um, those peer support advisors, um, they're housed within New Life and the Parenting Network. And for example, the youth um, peer support advisor will call the parents, ask for permission um, that the child can attend um, the programming and classes there, and then just kind of talk with them and see like, what does your child like to participate in? What do you think that they could use more of? And then make sure that they're creating that individualized plan along with the child. And um, then we do have a parent peer support advisor that collaborates with a parent and engagement specialist to kind of determine what classes and programming would best suit the parents and their schedule. 
Um, and something great that they do is outreach with the family. So uh, maybe they don't, some families don't quite think that they need um, that parent support. And so the parent support specialists will go out um, to the home, maybe with the engagement specialist and just kind of give them more information about why they might want to participate. So this is that Arizona self-sufficiency matrix that I was talking about. Um, it's just 20 domains that measure outcomes to provide more insight into each family's needs. So this is just the first page of um, the forms, but there's 20 of them. And then here on the side, you can see um, the there's a bunch of different categories that just kind of give a better understanding um, of what priorities um, the family might not have been aware of, like they don't know where to start with their goals. And so we do this at entry and at exit. Um, and this is just kind of how we determine um, the success of each family um, if they've improved their score a lot. And then this is, I just thought I'd provide um, from quarter one to quarter three, this is just some of our families, um, their scores. So some people, um, they increased a little bit and some made a lot of progress. We just um, wanna make sure that we're providing them enough resources during the time that they're in the program that maybe eventually they'll increase the score um, on their own. They have been provided with all that we can give them and we just hope that they do not return to CPS. Um, and then I just wanna highlight again, the importance of that peer support and team collaboration. Individuals with lived experience providing support and mentorship is so important. Um, we allow those um, families to build trust and connect with who they feel comfortable. Uh, maybe they just relate better to the parent peer specialists. Um, and so we allow them to maybe communicate more with them and still do those visits with the engagement specialist and just make sure it's um, communicated across the board. Um, being able to provide as many resources as possible. So allowing all of us to work together. Um, we have different people in our network at our different agencies. And so we just make sure that we are able to connect them to what is best fit for them. Um, wrapping those services around the family and creating a bridge for resources. Like I said, after exiting, they can still have those um, in their back pocket and um, be able to use those in the future. Is and there then a I limit just... on, on how many uh, cases? Well, I'm sure there's limits how many cases you can take, but I'm just wondering yeah. if uh, promoting the idea of referring to you is something that, you know, that there can be some push for through, for example, guardians at LIDEM or DAs or social workers to say, you know, make sure they're aware you're there and how to uh, connect, um, you know, make the ref make the necessary referral for you so you can get up to scale as much as possible. Yeah, so we definitely have, we've gotten a lot of referrals um, from CPS. So we, within our first three quarters, we've had 154 um, families referred. So just because getting a hold of them or if they are just not interested in participating, um, there's lots of different reasons, but we've had 58 total families fully enrolled in the program. Um, so we definitely get enough, enough people in. Um, it's just a matter of getting them enrolled and getting them to participate fully in the program. Um, but it would be great for people to reach out um, different programs and let us know how they could be of help to the program and maybe connecting that way. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share this last slide here. Yep. This is, oh, okay. um, this is just some of the things that we've been able to help them without help families with financially and help them connect to. So, um, just been really flexible on the way we've been able to help these families and just relieve some of the financial stressors that they've had in their life. Sometimes that can, that can be a big part in their mental health. Um, just allowing to allowing us to make those financial support. Um, and, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I think a big one is obviously housing um, and then um, helping them with counseling and um, the mental health stuff, as I said. Excellent. Uh, good, good stopping point. Uh, and this uh, really does uh, just, I think, to me, it seems there's a lot of resonance between all these different programs, um, particularly around peer support and listening and being able to connect people to actual resources that they identify as needing, as opposed to the top-down kind of things that I think is, is somewhat dysfunctional and 
and intrusive and not well accepted sometimes. So I think a lot of these things good. I think it, it, our next session uh, on February 14th, we'll be hoping to look at uh, system and policy issues. And hopefully after that, we can maybe get people together to talk about how to really look at how comprehensive we provide these kind of good things that we've identified as being the most effective. How can we have peer support available at every level? How do we have make sure to connect people to housing and other things? So I think these things are all pointing in the right direction and hopefully they're not too small and dispersed, uh, or at least we can start moving towards something comprehensive. So I wanna thank all the uh, all our speakers. Brigetta had to leave, uh, leave early for another meeting, but um, Lauren, uh, Keisha, and Christine, thank you very much. And I think we're gonna shift over to the business meeting of the task force. Pete, do we wanna see if there are any questions before we transition? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah, I've been watching the chat and I think there weren't any, but yeah, if we have time, I didn't know if we were pushing our limits here, but I'd lo love it. if people can do questions, that would be great. Yeah, if you can do a couple questions, Barbara, I could use a minute or two. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, okay, sounds good. Well, um, I was, uh, first of all, I really appreciate um, the great information that was shared by all four speakers. I feel like I learned a lot and it also made me feel more hopeful to know that some of these positive efforts are moving forward in our community. And um, I, again, you might, might plan to be touching on it more next month, but I'd be very interested in learning about any efforts that may be underway to ensure that more programs like this are available so that we have an alternative um, for families to what the current system is, which for so many families doesn't provide this kind of wraparound support and peer support. How can we as a mental health task force um, help to support Lauren and Keisha and Christine and um, the programs and services that they're involved with to to grow and to expand and to have other programs using those kind of models that are strength based. Uh, Keisha, uh, we had to cut you a little bit short there. So do you have any any more comments generally about uh, any of the things that uh, we've we've touched on? And I guess one thing that occurred to me, maybe a question here was. Uh, your work with with uh, the, the the little ones, um, you know, w do you have thoughts on the damage or trauma long term from just the fact of unnecessary separations? We, we tend to do like take kids away and say we'll check back in six months, and um, it seems like that's probably not a good way to have parent relationships thrive. Well, yeah, so um, it, it's, it's really detrimental to not just the, the children and, and the babies, but it's also detrimental to the parents, um, specifically the mom, because generally speaking, mom is the one who loses um, placement. Um, and, and in those situations, when a child is removed, what, what I've seen pretty consistently is that um, the options or the, I won't say options, I'll say the opportunities for reunification are, are very difficult and almost impossible to attain. Um, I've had, I've seen many situations where children have been removed uh, from the home when um, many of the issues could have been remedied with, with stable housing. And so they remove the, the child from the home and place the child in a home that's, you know, in Waukesha County, for example, mom has no way to see the baby. Um, and it's difficult because she doesn't have stable housing, likely does not have reliable transportation. And um, they all set up appointments for mom to see baby um, at, a, at a meet point, but the meet point is not the most accessible. And then when she doesn't show, it's documented, well, mom's not coming to see the baby. It's not that she doesn't want to see her baby. She legitimately cannot get there. There's a number of barriers to mom getting there. And rather than removing children in those instances and paying a foster parent 
to assume parental responsibilities during that time and creating a separation between the child and the mom and any other family members, siblings, um, why not put that money towards affordable housing, help that mom get into stable housing? Because what I'm seeing is a lot of, you know, poverty isn't something that children can be removed for, but it's something that children are removed for a lot. And it has long lasting damaging effects. It has impact on mom's mental health because mom doesn't feel adequate. She doesn't feel like, you know, that, that she can win if she's fighting an uphill battle. It has an impact on children because now they're in a completely unfamiliar environment with unfamiliar faces, um, a completely different dynamic routine. Everything that, that's their norm um, is, is disrupted at that point. And, and then we also have to take into consideration um, cultural, cultural norms. There are things that culturally may look one way here and look another way over here. And a lot of our formal education has been based on westernized thought and that's not how every family operates. And so we have to be flexible and be aware and, and, and knowledgeable about what it is that we're seeing and how it's showing up and what the impact is on that family. Because what may look like roughness to you is not necessarily roughness in this family because that's the dynamic within this family. Now, will there be opportunities to maybe work on things to help them look a little bit differently? Possibly, um, but that doesn't necessarily, because it's different, doesn't make it wrong. And we, we have, have a question from, Den from Denise. I wanna see if we can squeeze that in. So I just saw the hand up there. Okay. Yes, this is Denise. I'm just curious, um, those programs, I know like Meta House, I'm familiar with that, but the other programs that were mentioned um, the child welfare system. I know in the past I had experience with a deaf parent and a deaf child or hearing parents with a deaf child either way. Um, the point is that I, I would like to know if that has changed over the years or if those uh, children are removed because of communication barriers in the home. I don't know if that's something that you see addressed in, in your programs, whether it's with a deaf parents or a child that's deaf, but the basically uh, barriers of communication as the reason for removal. Yeah, I um, actually, I have seen that um, specifically with, with a family that I worked with, they were Burmese immigrants um, and they, uh, immigrated to the States, um, sponsored through a Catholic organization. Um, and they immigrated from a, a refugee camp in Thailand. So when they came to the States, um, you know, everything's unfamiliar. They did not speak English at all. So every time I engaged with them, I had to have a, a translator. And this mom had recently had her 10th baby. Um, and I remember working with the, the social workers and child welfare was involved at the time because the, the accusation at the time was that she was neglecting her younger children and that the older children were having too much responsibility for the younger children. What they did not realize is that, you know, this family, large family, um, their culture is very family oriented. So it's not uncommon for the other, the older children to care for the younger children, not necessarily in mom's absence, but just everyone takes care of the children together. It's a group effort. Um, and, and that was something that was really lost in translation. They didn't understand that culturally because, you know, the, the, the science that we have here in America says children don't take care of children, but that's not culturally what they're used to. Um, the other thing was the issue with their diet. Um, they were Muslim, so they did not eat meat. They occasionally ate fish, but they only ate um, vegetables and rice, mostly fruits, vegetables, and rice. And that was an issue. Um, they were saying that the children were not being fed properly. There was not enough food in the house when what they were eating were their cultural foods, the things that they knew, and they didn't understand that. So they kept telling her that her child was not going to be healthy because she wasn't eating meat. But 
culturally and because of their religious beliefs, that's not something that they did. So allowing that space and, and also because she did not speak English and no one in the family spoke English but the children, it made it that much more difficult. And so child welfare was involved and there were often times where I had to say, hey, no, I had to step in and intervene and pretty much give them a lot of pushback on on removing children or, or being further involved with this family because it really wasn't necessary. There was no danger. The children were not in danger. Um, no one was unsafe for anything to that effect. It was just cultural differences that the team working with this family just didn't understand. And just a, a quick thought on that, this is Pete, uh, for, from a legal standpoint, um, if you're, somehow involved in a case where uh, deaf rights are not being uh, considered in, I mean, there's really a, a due process requirement that they have uh, adequate interpreters and it may be an ASL interpreter, it may be people that, that you know, are you know, both language and ASL and maybe whatever non-ASL language the person uses. It may take multiple people, but they have to get that right. People in the guardian ad litem office, I know Deanna mm -hmm. Weiss is one of the attorneys there that that had some cases and understands um, that you really have to do that. So if you've seen that happening, uh, contact me if you can't if, if, if you can't find anybody else, because that really should be addressed. There shouldn't be a communication barrier or deficit when you're trying to keep families together. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. And then also making sure that um, communication services, translation services are, are more easily accessible. Um, I know for, for smaller um, independent organizations, sometimes that the barrier um, to having those services is cost. It's pretty costly to have interpreters and, um, and, and signers and things of that nature. So um, and this is why cross systems work is is important um, because then organizations can partner and work together to, um, you know, in the best interest of the families that they're working with. Are we ready to uh, get to you, Mary? Absolutely right on target. Thanks, Keisha. Right. I would just like to add, um, and I, I did want to share that from the cultural perspective, that absolutely lines up with the deaf community and deaf culture because in, in the deaf community, we have our own culture. Yeah. And 90% of us, including myself, are born and raised by hearing parents. And so our communication with our hearing parents and our hearing siblings um, is often lacking and the education there is often lacking. And so the child welfare system views that as problematic yeah. because they see that, but they're the responsibility to teach their deaf child, but they don't always have the communication to teach their deaf child. And so sometimes they take a deaf child away because, you know, maybe they're not feeding them on the time, they, but you have to teach them. Nobody taught them as a deaf, if a deaf person becomes a parent, maybe they were never taught because they lacked communication growing up. So Absolutely, 100% agree. And thank you, Pete, for what you had mentioned as well. Okay, thank you so much to all of our panelists and Pete. And I have to turn my volume off on my phone. Um, for participating today. Uh, are you getting feedback for me? A little bit. Okay, I needed the document on my phone. Uh, we're going to take a look at the 23 calendar. Mary, this is Barbara. Excuse me. I don't know if you saw I texted and messaged you in the chat that because we are so short on time. I No, I didn't see that. Okay, I had suggested that we just share the survey and send the okay. information in an email, if that's okay. okay. So nope. maybe you could just explain about the survey and then I can okay. put a link in the chat. Sure. There will be a, uh, there was a survey created 
to look at what people's interests are for the task force meetings for 2023. Um, Barbara will uh, email that out to uh, everybody that's on the listserv. And um, Barbara, is that, is, that is correct? Yes, I'm going to put the link right now in the chat and we will also send a follow up. So we would like to hear from everyone with their suggestions for topics and speakers for our 2023 calendar. Okay. No, I, I was in transit. I was doing the meeting in my car and I was able to make it home for this part of the meeting, so. Sounds good. The link well, Barbara, is in the... Do you wanna take the next uh, section, Barbara, policy updates? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Jeannie, are you able to share the PowerPoint that I had provided? Yes, I what? will. I will get thank that going. So That'd be great. Oops. So actually the topic that we are gonna be discussing now, I think is very timely because we just heard about some really um, innovative and impactful programs for serving uh, parents and, and children and in the child welfare system. And if we wanna see more of these kinds of programs, we will need to have support from policymakers, um, both in the budget and um, potentially with legislation as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some state policy updates. I'm sorry, Barbara, I had to close it and get back to the Zoom because it hit underneath and I couldn't get to anything, so. No um, worries. <laughs> okay. We all love technology, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you so much. So this is uh, gonna be a quick briefing for you on state policy updates. Uh, so next slide, please. So just a reminder about our state election results to let you know where we are. So in Wisconsin, we have divided government uh, based on the latest election. We have continued to have large Republican majorities in both the state Senate and assembly. There may be a super majority in the state Senate. Um, there actually was, and then my Senator, Senator Darling, a Senate district resigned. So um, temporarily there is not a, a super majority and there will be an election this spring. Could folks please um, mute so we're getting a little background noise. Thank you. Uh, and of course we have a democratic governor, Governor Evers was reelected, um, Attorney General and Secretary of State and a Republican uh, treasurer. So those are the results of the last election. Next slide, please. Uh, and at the congressional level, uh, US Senator Ron Johnson was reelected and we had a little bit of change in the makeup of our congressional delegation. We now have six Republicans and two Democrats. Next slide. So what do the results mean? Uh, since Governor Evers was reelected, state agency appointed leadership will remain um, more or less the same. Um, we have had, uh, you know, some transitions, Secretary Kim, Karen Timberlake uh, for the Department of Health Services, for example, um, resigned and we're still waiting to hear who the re replacement will be. But we expect that the policy direction for state agencies will remain similar. And in some areas, there haven't been changes. The majority, for example, uh, Secretary Carr and Department of Corrections is still there and, uh, and many other agencies have not changed either. Uh, Craig Thompson and Department of Transportation still there. Uh, the state legislature had chose the same leadership as they had last session. So uh, Rep Representative Voss continues as speaker and Senator Lemahue as the majority leader. Uh, the general policy direction and leadership relationship with the governor may remain the same. There's been a lot of talk about having more communication uh, between the legislature and the governor's office. So we'll see what happens with that. Next slide. One thing that I really wanted to call to your attention is lots of turnover in the legislature. 
30% of the folks in our state legislature are new to their position. And most of those have been elected for the first time. Some moved from the assembly to the Senate. Uh, very few of them have served for more than 10 years. And uh, there are a lot of new faces. In the assembly, there are 24 new members and there's seven new members in the Senate. Most legislative staff are also new. So what that means to us as advocates is um, we have an opportunity to build relationships, a lot of new people, and to do a lot of education. And you wanna make sure and check who your legislators are because they may have changed. Next slide. So legislative committees. Um, just over last week, all the committee assignments were posted and I included the link here to see that. And uh, it's very easy to view the information for Senate committees, assembly committees, and joint committees. And we'll talk about a few important ones for mental health advocates. Next slide. So it, we actually have in the Senate a newly configured uh, committee that has mental health in the name. So we hope that'll be a good thing. Uh, it's the Senate Committee on Mental Health, Substance Abuse Prevention, and Children and Families. So honestly, it just, you know, has the same focus as the conversation that we've had here today with uh, our four community uh, agency representatives who are, who are doing such important work. Uh, the chair for this committee is Senator Jesse James, and he is in the seat formerly held by um, Senator Kathy Bernier, and he's an individual who has been uh, someone who's really had an interest, he was previously in the assembly, in mental health issues. So definitely someone uh, to develop a connection with. And then the other committee members are listed here, and they do include Senator Latanya Johnson, who has been a great legislat legislative leader from the Milwaukee area. So some of you may be constituents of Senator Johnson. So if so, um, you know, reaching out to her is really great to do and developing a relationship and being a resource. Next slide. Here's the Assembly Committee on Mental Health and Substance Abuse Prevention. Now, the Assembly, they have a lot of committees and they have had a committee with this focus for a number of years now. And Representative Tittle has been the chair for a number of years as well. There are a couple of um, representatives from the greater Milwaukee area Representative Dietrich, I believe her district is in uh, Waukesha County. So possibly she represents some of you and Representative Vining in the Wauwatosa area and Representative Moore Amakundi from Milwaukee. And I may be missing someone because there might be some new names that I'm not catching, but anyhow, also an important committee. A joint Committee on Finance. So this year you're gonna be hearing a lot about the state budget this is a biennial budget year in Wisconsin. Every other year we go through a very long and sometimes painful process for determining what the state budget is gonna be. And that'll obviously be really important in terms of the services and supports that we believe um, should be prioritized. And these are the committee members. And in terms of folks um, from the Milwaukee area, again, Senator Johnson is on this committee as is Representative Goyke. Both of them are in the minority, but um, they both are strong advocates and um, have an important role to play on this committee. Next slide. Some of the other committees of interest, um, the Joint Committee for Review of Administrative Rules. Earlier today, I had shared an action alert from the National Association of Social Workers about how um, this committee, the Joint Committee for Review of Administrative Rules is gonna be having a hearing this week and they are trying to um, make a change to the rules for social workers, which currently in, there is in place a ban on conversion therapy. And this committee has a proposal that would remove that ban from the code of conduct for social workers. So, um, so that was disappointing uh, too many of us to see, uh, but that gives you an idea how a committee with a really vague, uh, confusing name, Review of Administrative Rules, can have a pretty important role on mental health issues. And then he, some of the other committees, you know, Corrections Committee in both houses, the Education Committees, uh, the Committee on Housing, that's been a priority for the Mental Health Task Force, uh, 
judiciary and public safety. Uh, so uh, a number of different committees that we will be monitoring and keeping you posted on. Next slide. Okay, so we have some homework for you in addition to giving input on your programmatic uh, ideas for the mental health task force this year. We encourage all of you to look up who your legislators are. You can do that on the legislature's homepage, legis.wisconsin.gov. Uh, and once you figure out who they are, put their contact information in your phone so that you can easily reach out to them with a call or email. Sign up to receive their newsletter if you don't already get it. Uh, and again, you know your legislators may have changed. There are a number of new, new faces review which committees they serve on, and then reach out. If this isn't something that you do as part of your job, you can do it on your own time as a constituent. Really encourage you to develop a relationship. Uh, you can meet in the district. You don't have to go to the Capitol and um, establish yourself as a credible resource on mental health issues that impact people in their district and um, keep in touch. Uh, develop a relationship so they will look to you when they want to know uh, about a mental health policy issue or budget issue. Next slide. So um, what's going to happen in the coming weeks? Well, the tsunami has already started. Every day we are seeing a number of bills being circulated. Um, that includes legislation from the last session returning as well as new proposals that are introduced. So um, read your emails from the Mental Health Task Force listserv. I know there can be a lot of them, but we'll try and keep you posted on uh, important legislative developments. We also encourage you, if you haven't already, to attend one of the governor's budget listening sessions and share your priorities. And there is one, a virtual listening session. So you can do this from the comfort of your home or office tomorrow, I believe at six o'clock. So we've shared that link and it's here in the PowerPoint as well. The governor's state of the state address is coming up on January 24th. So that'll be kind of a preview of what the priorities will be for the administration. And we're already hearing about that. A lot of talk about increases in shared revenue, which would be very important and helpful for Milwaukee if that moves forward and, and other municipalities as well. Um, Investing in education, those are two of the themes I think we've heard the most about. Uh, and the governor will present his proposed budget to the legislature on February 14th. Uh, it will be referred to the Joint Finance Committee, which we already talked about, and that really kicks off the state budget process. And the, le the legislature, the Joint Finance Committee may choose as they did last time to start all over again, uh, and make their own budget from scratch, or they can uh, begin with the governor's budget. So uh, stay tuned. And as I said, uh, participate in the mental health task force and we will keep you updated. So next slide, please. This is uh, just a quick little run through of what the budget process looks like um, from when it kicks off in February, as I just mentioned, referred to joint finance, then we will have budget hearings held around the state. I hope maybe some virtual ones too. The Joint Finance Committee will develop their version of the budget and it has to go to the state Senate and assembly and they may make quite a few changes. And finally, uh, by late June, it should be with the governor for his signature. Yeah, he has a pretty powerful veto authority so a lot of changes can be made. Next slide. So elections, elections, elections. Uh, we don't have as many elections this year as we did the past two years, but it still is a very important year. So um, encourage you to mark your calendar for the spring primary, February 21st, and the spring election, April 4th. If you prefer to vote absentee or vote by mail, you can request absentee ballots for the year at My Vote Wisconsin. And you can do that today. Uh, that's something you have to do again every year and that option is currently available. Uh, we've included a few links to some of the resources that we have uh, about this election. Making your plan to vote has a lot of the different uh, dates that are important 
and the reg the deadline for registering to vote outside of your clerk's office to do it online or um, to send in your application is rapidly approaching. That's in early February. Our Disability Rights Wisconsin Voter Hotline is available to you year round. So don't hesitate to give us a call if you have voting questions. Uh, next slide, please. So what's on the ballot? Spring elections are nonpartisan races. So uh, the, the, vote, the, the one that's getting the most attention and that will have the most implications is the state Supreme Court race. Just as in the legislature, we have uh, a division on the Supreme Court, even though people do not uh, run as a partisan race, uh, they do align as liberals or conservatives. Uh, and there is a division right now on that court that could change depending on who is elected uh, to that race. And we're beginning to see candidate forums taking place. There are four candidates, so there will be a primary. So very important to be informed about that. Uh, in some parts of the state, there are a uh, court of appeals race and there are circuit court races here. And of course, for those of us who live in the eighth Senate district, we have a special election. There also are a lot of local races depending on where you live. So in some communities that could include county executive or mayor, not, not in Milwaukee County, but uh, in many communities, Madison, for example, is having a mayoral race. Uh, county board is up in some communities. City council, I know a number of Milwaukee city council seats are up and school board is, are up in many districts. Something that we don't see as often are um, constitutional amendments. And we are anticipating that several of them will be on the ballot uh, this election. So stay tuned, we will get you information about those as they move forward. So Jeannie, you can take down the PowerPoint now. Thanks for sharing that. I know we covered a lot of information, but um, we wanted to give you the landscape coming up with both the state legislature, the budget process, and uh, as well as the, uh, the upcoming election. So I don't know if there are any questions that anyone might have at this time. Be happy to answer them if there are. Great. Otherwise, we encourage you to go back, as I said, and do your homework. Look up uh, on the legislative website to see who your legislators currently are uh, and reach out to them and work on developing that relationship and serving as a resource for them on mental health issues. So thanks, everyone. I will turn it over. <laughs> Denise is going to do her homework. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> All right, I will turn it over to Mary, who is going to give us an update on what's happening uh, in Milwaukee County. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara, I just emailed you. We actually have a flyer um, announcing the public comment on January 26. Are you able to post that on the share? Um, I did not receive it yet, Mary. I will watch oh. for it. And if I do, um, okay, I will that's fine. The information, I will definitely send it to the list, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Mental Health Board, we have a public comment session. Uh, first off, I want to share that starting in January, at John, January 26th, we are going face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, going live with the mental health board meetings. Um, so that will be happening. Our public comment meetings will be held uh, at Washington Park Senior Center. So the first one will be January 26th at 4.30 p.m. And uh, we really would like to hear people's input. Um, we do have a flyer available. And uh, I did just send it to Barbara. Um, and as she said, she will send it out to everybody. And if you could disseminate it to your circles of interest, that would be wonderful. 
because we've had little to no comment at the public comment. And that really doesn't give the board any direction as to what is the will and the wishes of people in Milwaukee County. Um, so then what that leaves is uh, the direction of administration as to where they would like us to invest money in programming and, and, and uh, to, to do things of that nature. I mean, we have some direction as the board um, and we know that, you know, as far as investments in community-based services and um, areas of expansion, and now that we don't have the cost of operating a hospital where, where we need to invest additional dollars. And, um, but uh, we really need to hear from the community. And this is a general session, so it's not limited to budget or anything of that nature. Uh, Denise, you have a question? I'm just curious, what kind of input are you looking for? Uh, what is the board's looking, uh, board looking for? I'm just curious. Any kind. <laughs> um, any kind, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mary. Expenditures, how we're spending money, uh, our service is good, our service is bad. Um, um, where do you think we should, should we do more for prevention? Should we um, uh, add more people into a particular area? Um, any ideas, any innovations you, you could see happening? Any, any way that you think the behavioral health services could offer services differently, whatever your ideas are, um, whether it's positive uh, 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 input, positive or negative, anything that you have to offer. So, um, so that's um, and we have. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome, Denise. We have three public comment sessions, I believe, out of the year. Uh, you know, I just had my calendar sitting here and I'm constantly moving things so the dogs don't, the puppies don't get them. Uh, we have uh, a public comment um, that happens in the summer and that's relative to the budget. And then we have one in the fall. And um, so um, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of public comment has been around the redesign and it was a lot relative to the structuring of the um, mental health emergency center and Granite Hills Hospital. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on an update on both of those. Uh, there was um, a meeting Monday. Um, so the first the first Monday of the month, wait, let me look at my calendar. Yes, no, it's the second, the second Monday of the month at six, six o'clock is the meeting of the community stakeholder advisory group. And that is a community group of the mental health board. And there are some vacancies on that group and Brenda Wesley is the chair and um it meets the and that group is meeting virtually and i don't know if it's we're going to be meeting um in person i don't know what the status is and the purpose of that group is to it's a it's the purpose of the group is to um be the grassroots out in the community of various communities to inform what is going on within the behavioral health system and uh, to be the boots on the ground, basically. So if you have an interest or know somebody that may have an interest in being on the community stakeholder advisory group, um, you can email me um, or uh, 
con reach out to Barbara and she can get in contact with me and I'll reach out back to you. And um, there are certain categories of uh, peers or family members. Um, we, we really have a need for some young people, young adults on that group that we were never able to fill. Um, we had some people that came on board. Uh, the maximum, the range is 11 to 17 people. And I think we have nine, nine people on there right now. So there is room for individuals to come on board. Um, so we have representation from the LBGT community the Muslim community, the African-American community. Uh, we have uh, representation. Uh, I'm on there as a member of the mental health board um, and as a person with lived experience. Brenda is the chair and I'm in, on there as a member, a family member. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Troni Small is on there as a family member and an advocate. Desilyn uh, Smith, who I had mentioned last month, who was featured in an article in Men's Health, is on there as a family member. Um, so there's an opportunity to be involved in advocacy and education at a, at a, a grassroots level. Um, so that's an opportunity to be engaged with the Mental Health Board. Um, and then um, the first actual mental health board meeting that will meet in person, our meetings will be held at the Zufari building on Blue Mound Road outside of the zoo. And our first meeting there, um, excuse me, is February, Would have helped if my list would have been here. 23rd, finance meet, meets at eight in the morning and the board meets at nine. And um, you can also go on to mental health for Milwaukee County Mental Health Board on Facebook. Our Facebook page is active. And if you want to find, easily find the schedule for all the mental health board meetings and its committees, instead of do, digging through the legislative, whatever that thing is called, you can go on to Facebook and find the schedules for all the meetings via Facebook. And um, that schedule will be posted there. And there will be information about the advisory council posted there and other things will be posted there in the near future. Um, uh, it said on the agenda, something about a representative, Pastor Lanier, who filled the role as a legal representative on the mental health board, um, had indicated a while back, he took a new position um, about six months ago for um, his, his, one of his jobs and said that he needed to move on from the mental health board and I just got an email um, that they had find they had they have found um, somebody, um, and I don't have all the details yet. That um, is a legal person that is a retired corporation council member, and the corporation council is the legal council for Milwaukee County. Um, that has um, stepped up to be on the mental health board. So we've been looking for at least six or seven months for somebody to replace Pastor Lanier. So right now, uh, all of the positions on the mental health board are filled. Uh, the, uh, the county executive just interviewed the attorney and interviewed um, the person, the uh, doctor to replace um, Dr. Johnson, who was out uh, out of the uh, medical school in Madison. So that's an update. And so we have two new people coming on board. Um, at the meeting in uh, February, uh, or well, actually, it'll come to the meeting in February. We have a governance meeting on Thursday, 
and the mental health board is looking at having a retreat. We had one, um, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, and we're looking at uh, having a retreat. Um, our research uh, analyst, uh, Kate um, Flynn did a survey. So that'll be coming, those results will be coming to the board at the uh, February meeting. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Do you, would you like to know something about the mental health board that I can come back and tell you next month about? So this is just basically what's, what's happening and just uh, some general information about the mental health board. Um, um, committees, the governance committee, in December was made a permanent committee. It had been an ad hoc committee and was determined that it needed to be a permanent committee. Um, the chair positions will change in February. Um, so I think that's pretty much. Oh, the last thing I can tell you is Barbara had put out the list of potential topics for the February meeting. And one item that's not on there that um, needed to be on there is Jeremy Triplett from Prevention. We'll be speaking at the meeting. Some of you may have seen the news story. I believe it was on Fox News about a, a new vending machine that was put in. Mary, that the, was listed. Harm reduction was listed on the agenda. Just oh, it, it was listed. As, uh, okay, I didn't. I didn't pick that up. I'm sorry. Um, um, uh, this new vending machine is being funded under the opiate settlement, and uh, Fox News had highlighted it. And uh, Milwaukee County purchased. I don't want to take the steam out of his his presentation, but they purchased X number of vending machines that are being modified and the men, the vending machines um, will be distributing Narcan, fentanyl test strips, uh, drug disposal kits and uh, uh, gun trigger locks. And um, so I, the understanding that was told to us at the board meeting was the first seven will go to the highest um, the, the, the top seven um, fentanyl overdose areas in Milwaukee County. And if I can remember correctly, looking at the data, one of those was in Greenfield and the first one, or there is one being placed at the Greenfield Police Department. They do have to be kept in an area that's temperature controlled because of the Narcan. So, that's a little piece of information and a highlight about uh, one of the things that will be discussed in February. Any questions, any comments, any, any suggestions, any ideas of what you want to hear about, about the Mental Health Board and future meetings? Okay, well, with that, I don't know if there's anything in the chat. I don't think so. Um, okay, so with that, we will end on time. I'd like to thank Barbara for PowerPoint and all of her information on uh, the, the new legislature and uh, voting and all of what's coming up and and I get to I moved to Wauwatosa, so now I have to learn my new my new person. Uh, Christine, thank you so much, and uh, everybody have a great evening.